first of all, well, thank you for being here, and uh, I hope you also uh, enjoy the questions. And <laughs> <laughs> so we would like to start by introducing also to the others uh, just quickly the Desakota. Well, it was a text written by Terry Mackey in uh, 1991. Uh, and uh, well, the Desakota, it, it's uh, it's subject uh, from Asia. Asia. Uh, it's not quite the same as what we can see in Europe uh, or in the West, more general, because we could say it's a kind of uh, very urban space, but it's more than this. Uh, the Desakota took place in, the, in, a, in an intense populated area in uh, Asia. Then because of this, uh, there were a lot of people, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about it later. And uh, in Asia, there's no uh, strong separation between uh, the rural area and the urban area, the, the both are linked together. Uh, and also, there are some di distinction between the Desakota types, uh, because they, they didn't have the, the same situation between the international world uh, and the cities themselves. So that brings me to the three types of Desakota. Um, in some places, or some cases, there was a transition uh, from the rural to the urban uh, area. Uh, this caused less agriculture and uh, more uh, city-oriented development. That means that people left the area, uh, the rural area, and goes to the cities. Um, and in those cases, the city and the industry uh, developed, but not as much as in the second case, where the rural people moved to the industrial areas. Uh, this was possible because of uh, in the, the the rural areas where the paddy fields were mostly for rice rice cultures, uh, people had a lot of, uh, let's say, knowledge because rice is just a seasonal culture. Uh, these people had the, yeah, the knowledge to do something else and they were uh, mostly employed in the industry. And that means that both agriculture and industry could develop uh, rapidly. And the third case, it's almost the same as the second case, but there were a lot less employment uh, in those desacotas. That means a slow growth. Uh, then some characteristics uh, that are in all these desacotas. Um, as I said, the availability of men labor, and a lot of it, because those cities took place in uh, intense populated area. And also the development of these non-agricultural uh, activities. Uh, there was also a good transportation system uh, or network because the, the canals were used for the ir irrigation of the paddy fields. Uh, and that means good transportation both for persons and for goods. And another characteristic is that the rules that were for the city, from the city, they didn't took place in the Desakota. Something else could happen. Um, I would like to add um, quickly to this to uh, the work we did this semester. Mm -hmm. So we have 10 different groups. And uh, our three groups, we have three groups that uh, worked on the and uh, city territory. So the first group was uh, study Tokyo. The other group was study Bangkok, and the last group was study Hanoi. Parallel to this group, we also studied the West Rosalma. And uh, the first group investigated the mystery of the territory with industry. The second group is interested 
accepted in the world of the forest and the territory, not only as an ecological regulation system, but also as a structural element of the landscape. And the last group studies the potential of the transportation infrastructure. So uh, the first question we would like to ask is um, if you have observed since 1990 when you first wrote your text um, whether the Zagato regions are, as you said, um, as they show a sort of short-term persistence or if they are a transitory phenomenon. Um, now, more than 20 years later, is there a stable form of metropolis in those areas, or is the Desert still, um, does it still apply? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is a really crucial question because this particular um, work that was published in 1991 grew out of a uh, protracted period of uh, field work in Java, the island of Java in Indonesia. Uh, which is about the size of the United Kingdom and uh, not the United Kingdom, of England uh, and uh, it had it had at the time that I began this work uh, some of the highest population densities of any country at a similar level of development uh, in the world so it was an intensely crowded island, beautiful island, primarily a major um, agricultural activity was uh, irrigated rice, which was, an, as an ecological form of, uh, of agriculture, uh, had a particular feature which enabled uh, population to continue to grow because it had the capacity by just working at growing the crop and preparing the fields and generally uh, making them more productive but also adding organic fertilizer from the burning of the rice husks that had been in existence before it encouraged what was called by one of the a very famous american anthropologists Cliff Geertz was called um, urban involution. So under that system, it was capable of absorbing growing population. But of course, it came at the cost of, of the levels of, of, of uh, income uh, that, that could be earned. But nevertheless, it was able to absorb over a period of something like uh, uh, 300 years from the time of the world, well, more than that actually, uh, 500 years from the period of the arrival of the Dutch, it was able to keep absorbing people without greatly increasing the level of urbanization, that is, but also by proliferating employment in non agriculture by people who would weave baskets or would make clothing or would. And this is not a practice that. You who live in Europe and know your history was was at all uncommon in in Europe as well and in throughout Europe. It's a historical process. So it 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 created a extraordinarily dense and intensely populated mixture of rural and non-rural activity. But it was very different for what began to emerge when I did my field work in Java. Because uh, in the early historical period, that work was done primarily during off-season, during the non-harvesting period and the non-preparation of rice fields period. So that meant that you already had uh, uh, what the word is, what I would call an in, in situ, uh, a contextual situation in which uh, a persistent historical form of settlement and landscape and occupational structure uh, was quite adaptive to the beginnings of development processes which were beginning to accelerate in the island of Java from about 1970 onwards. That is, increasingly 
Java was becoming a cheap labor location for the location of offshore industry uh, that was being relocated from the textile factories of North America and the clothing factories of North America and Europe into uh, the countries of Asia and a process which had occurred earlier in the case of India in the 19th century. So uh, it's important to understand that this particular perception of Desikota, of this particular concept of Desikota, grew out of a um, out of a contextual setting which favoured a, a condition in which urban and rural or non-agricultural, not urban, non-agricultural and agricultural activities interacted. And sometimes they were, people would go in the off season and work in factory. And this was just fine with, with people who were uh, establishing factories because at that time it's highly labor intensive. People were, uh, they weren't machine, you didn't need a lot of skills, you, you had to know how to sew or you had to know how to uh, lift bags or do something that labor was involved in. But it meant that, um, that this was a condition that there was a, a culture that understood what the processes of modern development, speech marks modern, development were occurring. So that's the first point to understand, that uh, it grew out of a particular context. Uh, but but as I did that, I began to realize that the same processes were occurring in other intensely populated regions of Asia. Like, for instance, the, the area that surrounds Calcutta along the Ganges River and to the further south. Like, for instance, the Pearl River Delta in Guangzhou in South China. Like, for instance, the Yangtze Delta in uh, China. Uh, like, for instance, the areas around Manila in the Philippines. Uh, much less so in the 80s in Vietnam, uh, which was still ex very much divided between rural and, and non-urban and a very uh, a culture that that wanted to keep the rural for quite a long period of time. Okay, so and and in uh, Malaysia, is the exception to all of this. The Malaysian Peninsula was very different, and that's why I put it as a, I think a type three. Uh, so I wanted to stress that the understanding of this and, it, and the question about its relevant its relevance or comparison with Europe is, I think, rather a very perceptive question and a very important question, because the European experience, while it has many elements of this, is different in terms of the ecological and the, and the agrarian base upon which that uh, whole tradition of uh, the growth of the whole transition of urbanization occurred. Now, it was even different within Europe, as we all know, uh, particularly if you went into sub-regional manifestations of it, because you know you have a serious difference between southern Italy and, and, and parts of northern Italy. And you have uh, all sorts of regional differences, which lead to different forms of interaction between rural and urban. Some of it, the rural completely de declined a process which is still occurring and is replaced by industrial agriculture. Peasant farms are consolidated and uh, they become machine farms, they are factories, they are fact agricultural factories, and uh, labor is employed, it's not peasant, it isn't a family-based occupation, etc., etc. So, it, my thinking about this began by thinking about what the theory was about how did urbanization happen in, from the 1800s onwards. And 
Now, of course, we know that there was urbanization long before this because there's a very strong tradition of pre-industrial urbanization in many parts of the world. But how did it happen after the colonial, how did it happen in conjunction with colonial, colonial uh, control and colonial, um, colonial period? And, uh, and so a particular set of different conditions and processes operated. So I, I, I sense in reading through your question that you're very cognizant of this, you understand this, but, but it's important to understand that this is a process that goes on, is going on. All urbanization is not a process that, stop, that stops. It can decline, and we can get, uh, what is the word being used for cities that are declining in numbers? There is a, a whole uh, shrinking, that's right. Uh, I don't think they're shrinking so much as population is shrinking, but in territorial terms, they may not be shrinking. Uh, but anyway, that's another matter. But, and then there are cities which are expanding hugely and rapidly. Uh, <coughs> like Tokyo, which went from being right. Uh, when I first went there in 1961, Tokyo metropolitan region didn't even exist. It was a, a collection of a, a main city of Tokyo, uh, Edo as it was called, and uh, some surrounding secondary cities, not really cities, towns to be honest. Uh, and the, the whole network of um, fast commuted trains, which was begin, had begun to develop in the 30s, really only accelerated in the post-war period. And Tokyo is unique. It's the largest city in the world, large, I must not use the word city, it is the largest urban, what I call extended urban space. It, 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 in the world. It is roughly 36 million today. And it is one of the few large mega urban regions that grew up on, on a transport network of, road, of rail. One of the major features of most of the Asian areas in which you work is that there are no hugely developed, apart from China, uh, which is a different case for reasons I can't explain. There are no real developed systems of public rail transportation in, in Asia. There are, but they are very small and they mostly coincide with cities, just the city boundaries. There are not, as in Kentucky's case, they go out for 15, 20, 30 kilometers and then they connect with bus systems that take people out into the desert coda, in the region, it's still a desert coda in Tokyo, but it's, it's, it's very different in, in, its, in its features from what exists, for instance, in Indonesia. So, uh, someone you would talk about here, and you say, uh, now this is a transition, this is a process which is dynamic, it changes, it changes all the time, and you ask me, is this so? I, I believe so. And what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is really what is happening to this economy. Uh, because I think it, it, it's changing its character a great deal. As the processes of globalization and technological change associated with, uh, with the communication and with uh, the decentralization of certain forms of industry and service activities and retailing systems into the countries of Asia occur. This is completely restructuring the way Desicota is operating. It is not that kind of image that you have where there is a rural farm and people are bringing in organic vegetables to the people who live in apartment blocks that are 40 stories high. Uh, this, this is not what this is. This is not that kind of dream of interaction. Is not what's occurring so much in Asia. It is being quickly taken over by highly sophisticated distribution systems, and the major outlet are supermarkets. Uh, 
just as the major outlets are increasingly becoming the uh, Kias and the, and the uh, IKEA and the uh, other major global companies that that are now being established in, in, in the Asian region of Desert So that's a kind of broad overview of where I'm coming from, but I understand where you're coming from because you're talking about a particular formulation that you read, which grew out of a particular condition in, in the 1980s. And uh, I think your questions are very, um, are, are very good. Um, do you want me to sort of go on and take your questions more specifically? Maybe we should go on with the next question. Yeah, I maybe. just have another question on sure. what you yeah. said. Uh, you, you said that in Asia most people were doing and not thinking, if I simplify. It was men labor and not uh, uh, people would like to change the situation. Then the industry from the West came and they used this men labor. Then does that mean that it could um, is the Asian situation the the dream uh, of the industries if they were king in our world? I don't know if you understand our what yeah, I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this process whereby this um, condition is changing is highly related to um, mass communication, to uh, systems of communication and to systems of retail and distribution. Uh, what is happening in, in Asia today, not only in the cities but in the countryside, is that people are um, being created as consumers by advertising, by the processes of uh, status description. That is, it's just an article in in what is it, twenty minutes, twenty that. Uh, French Journal, the little newspaper that comes out daily, 20. It's just, you know, like a broadsheet, like that's like small. Uh, anyway, just this morning I saw an article about, about uh, China, which, uh, which said, you know, China today is, is, is Oh, I saw that, yeah. You're creating something like 120 about million online cars are being purchased a yeah, month. Yeah, but it's also about online commerce. Yes, right, yeah, yeah. And, and people no, are, remember. Uh, people were being interviewed, middle class people from China being interviewed, not Asian people. People, not very rich China, but people from, who are middle class were being interviewed. And, and their question was, why do you buy cars? Oh. And their answer was, oh, because it makes me feel good and I have respect in the community or status or, or whatever. So the consumer revolution has gone on throughout Asia. And it is not something that, it is something, of course, of which we know about in the West. Uh, and it is not something, in, in, in Asia, it is just occurring in the same kind of way. Even though you sometimes have very different in national income profiles uh, to um, to those that exist in Western countries, and also different funding systems, different banking systems, and loan systems, and everything else. So that change that changes the whole structure of of um, the retailing landscape of the economy. Because it becomes, as I was saying for lunch time, it, it's the landscape of Jessica is being mauled, uh, spelled M A U L E D, which in English we say the lion mauled somebody, clawed them. Uh, the English word is mauled, M A U L E D. And so I always say the Jessica landscape is being mauled right now. Because it's been created into large malls and supermarkets, which are 
breaking down the system of a food distribution which existed prior to this within this code. So uh, there's been so many changes of this nature industry has turned into. And this is not just something that happens because of Western influence. It's been embraced by governments. Uh, you, you don't have the creation of uh, someone built a huge shopping mall out in the Desert because the land is cheap. Uh, and uh, you can get the people who are from cities where the middle class and up income people are living who get in their motor cars in the weekend and go out and buy stuff. Uh, so um, this again is breaking down this kind of model of rural urban fusion which, which uh, sort of underpinned the ideas of this because of what I was thinking about in the 80s and certainly characterized Java at the time when I was developing this idea. And, and I think characterized parts of India and many other Indians that I attempted to generalize. Um, so let's just turn uh, to your specific questions. Is that OK? Is that right? You go to the next question. You should go on with the next question. Um, so in other words, I don't think, I think Descoda is a condition that exists, but it, it's, its characteristics are changing dramatically as uh, processes of development and uh, the kind of changes I've been talking about occur. I would deal with that this afternoon. Um, what are the limits of urban places? Is that the first one you've got? Uh, no, you this is the next question. So that's already the next. Yeah, I can talk about that. So maybe you should uh, you should do yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I think you've more or less answered that already, but yeah, okay. we're trying to, to know if, uh, in your opinion, the Zakota is something uh, we could be inspired for uh, from in European town planning, if it's able to achieve or it's something to avoid. I think yeah. now we can hope it. Well, I mean, I think you have to have, I, I call this, uh, you have to engage in a process of, of committed vision. That is, you have to be sure that that the idea of a, uh, a horizontal speech mark city, which is, includes large areas in which agriculture is mixed with non-agricultural activities, and which the landscapes are, uh, used to be highly integrated, and now <coughs> are becoming much less integrated because of the processes I've described. You have to think uh, whether that form of what I would call um, whether that process in the urban transition offers opportunities in the short term, by which I mean the next 50 years, for creating more livable, sustainable, and I would say just and equitable urban regions. Um, now, I happen to be, believe, and this is where the, you, you, have to, you, have to, you have to throw in your hat or into the ring, we say in English, you have to make a commitment. Uh, I believe that, that this form of land use, uh, this form of, of uh, Desicota that is emerging, if it is managed effectively, can be one of the most important ways of organizing human settlement in the next 50 years because it has the capacity to respond to much broader challenges that are global in nature. The first of those is climatic change, environmental uh, um, threats that are being posed by changes in the environmental systems. Um, which I think pose major challenges to the specialization of food production. Um, they have particular problems in, in places like the United States, where, say, for instance, uh, almost 90% of oranges are grown in Florida for the whole of Canada and the United States. So what happens if it gets disease? 
or it gets uh, climatic uh, conditions that are characterized by drought or intense periods of lack of water, then where did they get oranges from? They have to try to get oranges from a, from a world market which will immediately respond by increasing prices dramatically. And uh, if that is just a, a kind of a, that's an extra kind of food. But if you think of basic foods like wheat or rice, cereals and various descriptions of a high part of, of, of food content, then the possibility of creating uh, within uh, what I call extended urban spaces a capacity to develop uh, protection against vulnerability to climate change is the first point I would make. Second point is there is a volatility in the global economy. Uh, in, the, in the last 20 years, 1998, 2008, we've experienced very uh, dramatic changes in, uh, in, in the global economic condition. Um, and uh, the first one of those affected Asia very dramatically. Uh, the second one affected uh, the United States and Canada quite dramatically, Canada less so. But, but in, in, in the concept of this, there's a possibility of creating opportunities that diversify economic activities in a way that the threats that come from specialized areas of production uh, being challenged by these forces uh, occur. So that's, that's a, a second reason. The third reason is simply that um, the opportunities within this broader extended space of Desikoto um, for creating uh, locally directed uh, intensely participatory forms of social and economic life are very strong. I'm not saying this is to return to that lovely model of the village which uh, everybody loved everybody else and, uh, uh, and they were a form of life because we know that, that village life in, in Medieval Europe was not, for instance, exactly a, a love affair. Uh, so there are these possibilities, and, and I think that planners and, and, uh, and, and builders of the urban future have to begin to start thinking about these things. And there is a rather stark choice between what I would call the densely populated smart cities, which are the current fad, and a spread out city, which uh, the spread out extended urban region. And I got out of it. I, I had a, a, an interesting discussion last evening about this problem. But it, it is a semantic kind of, it's like you want to say city, but your mind says you're being stupid. Uh, because it's just part of your language. And people use city all the time when they mean metropolitan region, at least. Uh, and, and, and it's not, a, it, it, it's, it, it's a language thing, it is a mindset that it's terribly difficult to, to get over. Um, the other issue relates to uh, how does this affect the opportunity for people to achieve in terms of their um, lifestyle, their particular life goals, etc. And that's why I believe that, that the, the spread out concept of this occurring can be accommodated by digital forms of communication. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and, um, and they can also be combined with local knowledge as well, uh, with an attempt to revive local knowledge about the environment, 
about the history, about that sense of uh, social history that exists, uh, which in, in some ways is lost in the, the global images of the mega city that characterize the globalizing world. Um, I, I'm kind of, in that way, I guess I, I'm being very romantic. And it's, it's a highly romantic concept. And uh, I don't think I, I'm not trying to impose it upon anyone. I'm throwing it out. Okay? And uh, it can be discarded or you can say it's nonsense. But I think all those possibilities exist. We don't have to live in smart cities. Some of us can't afford to live in smart cities. Prices in, the, in Vancouver, my hometown, uh, about 70% of people rent because they can't afford to buy houses or apartments. And the occupational structure, it is a, a sort of a nerd city now. It has become one of the major centers for research on games and on, uh, on various forms of video communication. So a lot of these people are earning quite good money, but they still can't afford to buy uh, homes or houses or, or accommodation in Vancouver. So uh, they are forced into the desk color where they can afford houses, etc. So it does respond to these kind of conditions that are occurring in developed countries and are increasingly occurring in the countries of Asia. Anyway, that, now, that, that brings means, us to the next question, so yeah. I have to interrupt you exactly No, of course, now. I mean, I'm sorry, I, get, I'm, I cannot resist the <laughs> <laughs> However, push on. Yeah, we have another interrogation. Um, well, the data coda is based on cheap labor, all ways if we simplify. Um, but if all the industries are going to these uh, places, then it develops and it becomes what we would like to say a city. Then the cheap labor isn't really there. I mean, the people have more and more money because they can work more and more. Then what is the future of the Desacola if there isn't any cheap labor in those places? It's a, it's a, a, a correct question to ask about the conditions that lead to creation of Desicota at the time I was working in the, in the 1880s because at that point the so-called International Division of Labor was primarily shifting their operations because the cost of labor was increasing in Western countries. I mean, I think you're all familiar with that when you're in France or here or wherever. And, uh, um, the response to that has been that over time there has been um, a uh, oh, think about phrasing please. there has been increasing capital intensification in the industrial process so that they don't need cheap labor in the long run. So where is that labor going? Well in the in in, in the cases of places like Korea and the countries that have developed, that labor is going into cities. Uh, it is being educated to become the uh, workers in the service industry, primarily. So what is that doing to Desicota? Uh, it, it is beginning, as in the case of Japan or Korea, to empty out the villages. So the former villages of Desicola are now, there is no longer, the Desa are disappearing, the villages are disappearing. They are populated by, by older people who are hanging in, who are hanging into their life because that's where they grew up and, and they have deep attachment to their land and their life, and, uh, et cetera, right? And they live off transfers from their children. You're not even farm all that much these 
States. So in the countries that have become highly urbanized, Korea increasingly, China is rapidly increasing urbanization. China is now more than 50% urbanized. In the time in 1980 when I was writing, it was about 22%. Uh, most of Asia was like that, in terms of statistical difference. The boundaries of what is urban are entirely administrative. They don't reflect the reality at all in terms of what are people who are engaged in part-time rural activity or part-time business in a way. Um, so uh, this this condition of uh, the changing economic condition is very much associated with the development trajectory that countries are going on. So the question is, does that lead to the decline of disencoding? Well, there's a conference with other countries that are not uh, that are not Desacota yet, or yeah. where the process could be. I think that in the highly populated deltas of Asia, this process is not yet leading to uh, uh, the complete uh, destruction of agriculture. Okay. But there are tendencies. So, Desacota is not a condition which uh, is inherently something that will survive uh, unless the managers, the politicians, the planners begin to think about how do we keep this, the elements of this Dakota that we believe will ensure the creation of viable societies for the future. Okay, very simple. But for most governments, they have very simple goals. They, they want to create uh, income for their country. And they wanted to do that in many ways, by trading and by uh, creating capital-intensive skills, skills for capital-intensive industry and everything else. Um, and many go governments in Asia are very successful at Japan was very successful for quite some period of time. Uh, China is immensely successful. Okay. So, is there an inevitability about the changing structure of agriculture? If we believe present trends are it. Um, and the only opportunities that exist for its persistence is a realization that that if we create the kind of landscapes in which rural and urban uh, non-agricultural activities mix together and they are managed effectively, it can be a very viable, viable extended urban space. I mean, the number of people who might earn full-time income from agriculture might be quite small. But there will be lots of people who will produce 20 or 30 percent of their food uh, in those areas. There will be lots of people who uh, can uh, begin to understand their consistence, can begin to manage it more effectively. So there's a, a lot of uh, the vision you have to have confidence that that kind of landscape. And there's no reason why you can't have both. There's no reason why you can't have both. Um, but I'm not romantic about this in color landscapes. I am, I am practical about the belief that the way those, that condition exists offers tremendous opportunities for creating more viable and less vulnerable national space. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Maybe there is a second part of the question that you could address about the uh,
Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you think will be the impact of growing energy and transport expenses in those regions? And what do you think it will be in Europe as well? Um, I, I don't know. I'm not sure about the European Union. Maybe uh, in the US. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. But, in, but, in, but in US and Canada or in Asia, um, Apart from Japan, the, the major culprit in the creation of the spread of urban activity into surrounding areas is the automobile, is motorized transport. Uh, and um, the provision of oil, uh, about the cost of oil and its liability as an energy source uh, in the coming uh, within. 20 to 30 years. Um, countering that, uh, the view that many multinationals engaged in um, motor car production engage in is that there are always technological responses to crisis. Uh, and um, when I went to China for the uh, Exposition in Shanghai in, I think it was 1910, uh, 2010, maybe 2011. General Motors had a pavilion which was showing the electric motor cars which um, could run on uh, um, strips in the road which didn't need people to drive. Okay? So uh, that uses what is thought to be, could be a renewable source of energy, namely hydroelectric sources. Um, and it uh, also uh, means that you can get a particular form of, that the automobile can be, continue to exist, but technology is changing so constantly. So, I mean, there's always technological responses to uh, a crisis in the manufacture, uh, solar cars, using solar energy. There are many uh, prototypes of these that have been, uh, been invented and which will, at the time that the automobile and the motorized transport that runs on gas becomes too expensive to use, they will be immediately put into mass production. But at the moment, uh, uh, another form of technological adaption is hybridization. Uh, that is creating part electric and part um, gas run cars. Uh, what do they call those things? Hybrid, 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 hybrid cars. Yeah. So there are many technological solutions that mean that the automobile as a means of transportation, plus this intense desire on the part of people, at least in developing countries, uh, to own motor cars because they are an important indication of their status and, and, and role in society. Uh, that means that I think the automobile is going to be around for a long time. Just as the use of coal, uh, China has just recently concluded a large number of agreements with, uh, with Australia and Canada which were involved in importing uh, coal uh, for the next uh, 20 or 30 years. And since they don't practice, at this point, a great deal of um, treatment of the end product of, uh, of making that coal into energy, it produces a mean smog in Chinese cities, which occurs periodically, generally in the winter. And then, uh, High um, so uh, the forces that keep the automobile or the motorized transport in the form of, 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 of important uh, mobility and, and transportation mobility within the city are quite strong. And despite all this prognosis about cost of oil. Uh, what does it sort of see that disappearing? 
something over the next 10, 20 years. And then technological developments, the United States has been using fracking to reduce oil from shale, and it has reduced, it has completely changed the oil market in the United States. Nowadays, the oil has increased its, its, at, at pump price by about 30 to 40 cents in the space of about three months because the Americans have just saturated the oil markets of, the, of North America with, uh, with the production of shale mining. So, uh, which some people have many doubts about the environmental impact of the fracking before it is sort of exploding things in, in, in the underground uh, part of the of, of space. Uh, anyway, whatever. So, the motor car's going to be there, and as long as the motor car's there, we are going to have expanding cities. Because they, the ownership of the motor car becomes a priority to live in the outer regions of metropolitan areas. <laughs> Unless there is adequate public transportation, whether it be by rail or bus. Uh, and some cities are developing that. Some uh, urban regions are developing that. So, um, so in Europe, I mean, I, I am constantly amazed about the ability to use um, rail transportation for urban networks. I mean, there's no more convenient place to travel in, uh, in Europe, although people who live here may not feel that way. But uh, as an outsider who comes, uh, this is, it is just so different from North America. Uh, you would not want to experience. So what you are saying is that uh, you don't see any major break, so energy and transportation will be uh, I mean, it's just going to be in the, I mean, in the next 20 years, unless something really mm -hmm. unusual happens, and it's possible because no one predicted the fact that the Americans would put a large amount of share all onto the U.S. market. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it wasn't a, in the economic uh, writing by the New York Times or anybody else that Germans get onto this thing. There wasn't there. Uh, so at the moment, uh, prices, the price of oil that's popular in, in North America is dropped by, by 30 cents a litre. Uh, yeah, so this will mean this is a force that will encourage ongoing expansion of urban areas, plus labor market, plus the fact that the price of, uh, apart from some parts of the United States, the price of uh, housing is increasing in the in, uh, then uh, people have to move out there if they want to own some kind of affordable housing. They have no option. They have to move out. Or else they can live in a rabbit hole. Uh, in, in Manhattan, I understand you can get a closed closet for about uh, a thousand US a month. More, more. I think that's, he's looking at me. Considerable suspicion. I, I have to keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so this this this, con this condition of living expansion into surrounding areas, whether they be intensely populated or whether they be large blocks of former plantations or farms or whatever, is going to go on. The UN says 70% of all urban population increase will occur outside cities in the next 30 years. Okay? Uh, and that all those efforts to identify the cities that's part of the smart city dream uh, are not going to prevent that. Unless there are innovative regulatory and not maybe innovative thinking that goes into how you kind of resolve this, 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 this urban expansion. Well, talking about urban expense, that brings us to the last question. 
Uh, the sixth one, if you want to check it. Yes, uh, number six. Yeah. yeah. So it is a more specific question about the subject we used to, uh, uh, to use to investigate the West Rosanna. Ah. So we choose to, um, to see the, to, um, the role of the forest in the territory as a, an ecological regulation system and also a structural element. So um, our question was, um, um, what do you think of the role of the forest uh, in the desert of the if, if, uh, if they play a role or if they are not relevant? Um, um. I, I think forests are only one element of, um, of a biotic landscape, uh, a vegetation landscape. And I certainly see that in some uh, urban areas in Asia, there are governments that are very conscious of the need to create, to green their city. The phrase is green their city. Um, and there's a lot of variation in how that is done. Uh, Singapore uh, is an example of what is being attempted to green a tropical city by uh, creating vertical greenery along the sides of buildings, by creating uh, park space, by creating all sorts of uh, elements of public space that are green not just parks, but also other things of activity. Um, so far, it's only part of that, right? Uh, and, um, <coughs> there is some, some realization or some encouragement of the idea of, of growing, um, of encouraging the persistence of forest or natural forest. Um, for instance, in, in Japan, this is very strong. Uh, there is a, a traditional system in Japan called Satayama, which is actually a system which believes that you must have natural landscape within your urbanizing landscape. It's a necessary part of the, of the system of belief that, uh, that existed in traditional Japanese society. So uh, forestry is part of and the name is Satyama, it's S-A-I-T-A-M-A-Y-A. And uh, it, is a, it is quite a strong uh, um, people-based um, philosophy. Yeah, I, mean, I guess it's a philosophy, yeah, but it's being applied. Um, What's it called, huh? How do you say it's spelled? S A I S A S A T A I Y A A M A. Sorry, I said that wrong before. I'm just sort of getting my vowels in the wrong place. But yeah, and that has been, you know, you can go into into Japanese cities and you will see that kind of area which has been which has been persistent. So that. It's not there because it can be harvested, although in some cases there's a lot of bamboo in it, and uh, it is common ground owned by the former village. <coughs> Newcomers to the village can't have access to that area, and it, it can be harvested and sold. Bamboo is very important uh, building uh, uh, material in, in, in used a lot in traditional flooring. Um, so, uh, so it's hard to generalize about forestry as such. There's a lot of talk about urban forest. I mean, if you read the literature, there's a lot of stuff about that. But I don't, I don't as I travel around those, those areas, see much evidence of that being put into practice. Uh, <coughs> it was a, a practice during the common period in China where um, large areas of forestry were, were planted uh, using mass labor uh, and uh, 
but not so much in urban areas, more in rural areas. So uh, it's not a subject of which I know a great deal. <laughs> but I think it's an important element within the landscape. Uh, okay. specific study in Tokyo or Hanoi or um, Bangkok. Uh, I'd be more than happy to give you some references or you may have seen them already, I don't know, but I'm happy to give you some, some additional material that might be helpful. Not, not the material, but the references. Okay. Okay. So now uh, we have a bit of rest for you and before the, the, the lecture. Five. Five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also want to introduce to you um, Professor Graham Shane, uh, that is uh, professor teaching at uh, Columbia University and a uh, very old friend of mine. And uh, we are very happy that he is here. And uh, in the debate, uh, uh, after the lecture, I hope that the grammar you can zoom to the, the scene. We, we were hmm? practicing at supper last night. <laughs> <laughs> you were practicing? Okay. Yeah, we, we began practicing. <laughs> Gramachene is the author of several books uh, like Recombinant Urbanism and other books, uh, Urban Design Theories uh, from uh, 1945. Oh, yes, Urban Design since 1945. Urban Design since 1945. A global perspective, etc. Okay. <laughs> so now, uh, thank you. And we stay here with the groups. Uh, 